And uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit late. Uh, my internet was not uh, connected, so I had to deal with that situation before I could come on and talk with you guys live. And uh, we have been studying out of the book of Revelations, Revelations chapter 2, and uh, we are on lesson 8 of our online Bible college study, and we have been studying the book of Romans, and we're reading Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 28, and our key verse, hallelujah, is there will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile, for God does not show favoritism. And this is Women of Grace, A Voice in the Wilderness, and uh, this is what we've been studying in Romans. I believe the very first study that we had did, I did on talk show, and um, my sound was kind of off um, that time. I'll probably do parts of lesson one over again uh, of Romans um, chapter two. But um, we are here right now who is the true Jew. Um, last time we talked, we talked about the law, we talked about the gospel, we talked about how the word of God can cleanse your conscience. We talked about the seared conscience. We talked about habitually living in sin. And today we're going to talk about who is the true Jew. Let us enter into prayer. Father, I thank you for this word on this morning, O oh Lord. I thank you, Father, that we have found grace and favor in your sight because you woke us up, O oh Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you sent forth your Holy Spirit to illuminate our hearts and our mind and to bring us to remembrance of what Jesus has said to us individually through the scriptures. We thank you for truth, O oh Lord God. We thank you, O oh Lord God, that you are opening up our understanding that we may understand who we truly are, Father. In Yeshua HaMashiach's name we pray, amen. We must remember that the book of Romans is the very foundation of the Christian walk. A lot of people believe that the Gospels were written before Romans, and that's not true. The epistles of Paul was written before any of the other epistles or the uh, Gospels were written. Hallelujah. But today we are talking about who is the true Jew. The Jews prided themselves in the fact that they were descendants of Abraham and therefore heirs of the promise given to him by God. Their radical descent was their great boast and their claim to special privileges with God. Yet the promises given to Abraham were of two categories. He was promised the earthly inheritance of the land of Canaan and a multitude of natural descendants who would possess it. But there was also a special promise given to him, a promise that involved a spiritual and heavenly inheritance. In Romans chapter 2, Paul shows that there are two lines of descendants from Abraham and the true heirs of Abraham's special promise from God are only in one of these lines. Let's go to Genesis chapter 22 and we're going to read verse 17. Genesis chapter 22 verse 17 and it reads, In blessing I will bless you and in multiplying I will multiply your descendants like the stars of the heavens and like the sand on the seashore and your seed hair will possess the gate of his enemies if you notice that seed is singular meaning one person one seed now at first reading it was seeing that the Lord is just using two different um, analogies to emphasize how numerous the descendants of Abraham would be. But as the New Testament reveals, God is actually referring to two different groups of descendants. 
let's turn now, um, turn your swords to Galatians chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 21 to 31. Galatians chapter 4, verse 21 to 31. Now here, Paul expands on our understanding of the nature of these two lines of descendants. He goes on to say, tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born in the ordinary way, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a promise. These things may be taken figuratively, for the women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabic and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free and is our mother. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. Here Paul refers to here Paul refers to the fact that Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, represent the two lines coming from Abraham. Ishmael pictures those born of natural descent, and Isaac pictures those born not by the flesh, but through faith in a promise. In Genesis chapter 18, verses 10 through 14, it reads, The Lord said, I will surely return to you when the season comes round, and behold, Sarah your wife will have a son. And Sarah was listening and heard it at the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in years. It had ceased to be with Sarah as with young women. She was past the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have become aged, shall I have pleasure and delight my Lord husband, being old also? And the Lord asked Abraham, Why does Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I really bear a child when I am so old? Is anything too hard or too wonderful for the Lord? At the appointed time when the season for her delivery comes around, I will return to you, and Sarah shall have brawn a child. See, we must understand that Sarah was beyond childbearing years. She was actually old. She was very old. And this is a miracle that God opened her womb, restored her womb, hallelujah, for her to be able to bear a son, the promised son, which is Isaac. Let's go to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, and we are going to look at verse 16 to 22. And it reads, Therefore, inheriting the promise is the outcome of faith and depends entirely on faith, in order that it might be given as an act of grace, unmerited favor, to make it stable and valid and guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the devotees and adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, who is thus the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. He was appointed our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and speaks of the non-existent things that he has foretold and promised as if they already existed. For Abraham, human reason for hope being gone, hope and faith that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been promised, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered the utter impotence of his own body, which was as good as dead because he was about a hundred years old, 
or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's dead, dead and womb. No unbelief or distrust made him waver, doubtingly question concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong and was empowered by faith as he gave praise and glory to God. Fully satisfied and assured that God was able and mighty to keep his word and to do what he had promised, that is why his faith was credited to him as righteousness, right standing with God. Abraham knew that he was impotent, that all his seed, his seed, the sperm, had already died. But he had faith enough to believe that God was able to restore both him and Sarah to be able to conceive a child. And he did not doubt it. He did not waver in it. He put his total trust in God. So when it comes to anything in our life, when it comes to healing, when it comes to um, being delivered, we must have the same faith that Abraham had. He called those things that be not as though they were, and he trusted God in his promise, the promise of his word that God was not able to lie, was unable to lie. And this is why it was accounted to him for righteousness, because he believed God. Now let's take a look at the uh, comparison Paul makes between these two lines. You have the natural Israel and then you have the spiritual Israel. The natural Israel and the spiritual Israel. The natural Israel, descendants of Abraham through natural birth, born through the flesh. The spiritual Israel, descendants of Abraham by spiritual birth, born of promise through faith. Let's look at John chapter 1 and we're going to read verses 12 and 13. And it says, but as, as many as did receive and welcome him, he gave the authority, power, privilege, right to become the children of God, that is, to those who believe in, adhere to, trust in, and rely on his name, who owe their birth neither to bloods nor to the will of the flesh, that of physical impulse, nor to the will of man, that of a natural father, but to God, they are born of God. Let's jump to John chapter 3 and we're going to read verse 3. And it reads, Jesus answered him, I assure you, most solemnly I tell you, that unless a person is born again, anew, from above, he cannot ever see, know, be acquainted with, and experience the kingdom of God. See, beloved, being born of water and the Spirit is a very important um, act in the Christian faith. Being baptized, hallelujah, where you are identifying with Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. And then being baptized in the Holy Spirit. These are two very important ingredients to the Christian faith of being a descendant a seed of Abraham. Okay, two, natural Israel. Abraham's union with Hagar, the slave woman, pitches the Jews in bondage to the law. Spiritual Israel. Abraham's wife, Sarah, the free woman, pitches the liberty that is found in the indwelling Holy Spirit. Let's turn our swords to Genesis chapter 16, and we're going to read verses 1 through 4. <coughs> Genesis chapter 16, verse 1 through 4, and it reads, Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had brought him no children. She had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. And Sarah said to Abram, See here, the Lord has restrained me from be bearing children. I am asking you to have intercourse with my maid. It may be that I can obtain children by her. And Abram listened to and, it, and heeded what Sarai said. 
notice that their names have not been changed yet. So Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her Egyptian, maid after Abram. Abram, Aram, had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, Aram, to be his secondary wife. And he had intercourse with Hagar, and she became pregnant. And when she saw that she was with child, she looked with contempt upon her mistress and despised her. Natural Israel. Turn your swords to Exodus chapter 19. And we're going to read verses 16 to 20. This is natural Israel. Picture in Mount Sinai where the law was given. I'm sorry, you can read um, you can read Exodus chapter 19 verse 16 to Exodus 20 verse 20. We won't have time to read all of that. But it pictures Mount Sinai where the, the law was given when um, the people were delivered out of Egypt. Spiritual Israel, turn your swords to Psalms 132, and we're going to read verses 13 through 16. Spiritual Israel, pictured in Mount Zion, where grace was experienced, and Psalms 132, verse 13 through 16 reads, For the Lord has chosen Zion, he has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever, says the Lord. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will surely and abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests also will I clothe with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. If you have received Yeshua, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior, and have repented of your sins and was baptized in water, hallelujah, and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Psalms 132, verse 13 and 16, is referring to you, the spiritual seed of Abraham. Natural, natural Israel, Israel, earthly Jerusalem, the natural Jews. Hallelujah. Turn your swords to Hebrews chapter 12. And we're going to read verses 22 to 24. Spiritual Israel. Heavenly Jerusalem is the church made up of Jews and Gentiles. For in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 22 through 24 reads, but rather you have come to Mount Zion, even to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to countless multitudes of angels and festal gathering, and to the church assembly of the firstborn, who are registered as citizens in heaven, and to the God who is judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous, the redeemed in heaven, who have been made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator, go-between agent of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks of mercy, a better and nobler and more gracious message than the blood of Abel, which cried out for vengeance. Here, this is talking about the wedding feast, that when Yeshua returns for his bride, there is going to be a festive a bridal party in Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem. Hallelujah. When Christ, the bridegroom, comes to receive his bride, then we're going into the marriage feast. That is going to be a wonderful, awesome experience to see the King of Glory coming for his bride. Natural Israel, the sand of the seashore, or the dust of the earth. Turn to Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 13 and we're going to read verses 14 through 16 and it reads, 
the Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had left him, lift up. Remember, his name is still Abram. It has not changed yet. He said, lift up now your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see I will give to you and to your, your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants like the dust of the earth, so that if a man could count the dust of the earth, then could your descendants also be counted. Let's, let's jump to Deuteronomy chapter 7, and we're going to read verses 12 through 15. And it reads, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 12 through 15, and it reads, And if you hearken to these precepts and keep and do them, the Lord your God will keep you, will, will keep with you the covenant and the steadfast love which he swore to your fathers. And he will love you, bless you, and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your body and the fruit of your land, your grain, your new wine, and your oil, the increase of your cattle and the young of your flock and the land which he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There shall not be made male or female barren among you or among your cattle. And the Lord will take away from you all sickness and none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which you knew will he put upon you, but will lay them upon all who hate you. Here, talking about the spiritual, the, the spiritual seed, hallelujah, talking about Israel. These were promises unto Israel, hallelujah. Let's look at the spiritual Israel, the stars in the sky. Let's go to Revelations chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 16 through 20. And it reads, In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth there came forth a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full power at midday. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if dead. But he laid his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the ever-living one. I am living in the eternity of the eternities. I died, but see, I am alive forevermore. And I possess the keys of death and hates the realm of the dead. Write therefore the things you see, what they are, and signify what is to take place hereafter. As, you, as to the hidden meaning, the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw on my right hand, and the seven lampstands of gold, the seven stars are the seven angels, messengers, of the seven assemblies, churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches spiritual Israel. The natural descendants of Abraham are heirs of natural promises. These promises include the promise of a land of their own. In Genesis chapter 13 verse 14 through 16 we find this account. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had departed from him, lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south, east and west. All the land that you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. Let's jump back to Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to read verse 7. 7. Genesis chapter 12, verse 7. And it reads, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. So Abram built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. God promised to bless, the, to bless Abram's offspring, to give them an earthly land as their inheritance and to prosper them if they continue to be faithful to him. 
but the spiritual descendants of Abraham, both Jew and Gentile, are the heirs of the eternal promise. Let's talk about the promised seed. In Galatians chapter 3, it provides remarkable insight into what this means for you. Let's turn our swords to Galatians chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 6 through 9 and verse 16 and 29, which reads out the King James Version, Consider Abraham. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. The scriptures foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith and are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scriptures did not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, which is singular, meaning one person who is Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Let's turn our swords to Romans chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 6 through 8. Now, the promise of God was to Abraham and his seed, and Paul shows here that this seed was Christ. In Christ, we became the children and the heirs of Abraham. Now, in Romans 9, verse 6 through 8, Paul elaborates further, and it reads, However, it is not as though God's word had failed coming to nothing, for it is not everybody who is a descendant of Jacob, Israel, who belongs to the true Israel. And they are not all the children of Abraham, because they are by blood his descendants. No, the promise was your descendants will be called and counted through the land of Isaac through Abraham, though Abraham had an older son. That is to say, it is not the children of the body of Abraham who are made God's children, but it is the offspring to whom the promise applies that shall be counted as Abraham's true descendants. Let's move on to verse 9. For this is what the promise said about this time next year will I return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only that, but this too, Rebecca conceived two sons under exactly the same circumstances by our forefather Isaac. And the children were yet unborn and had so far done nothing either good or evil. Even so, in order, Father, to carry out God's purpose of solution, election choice, which depends not on works or what men can do, but on him who calls them. We're talking about the spiritual seed. And that seed was Christ Jesus. And in Matthews, it talks about the genealogy of Jesus. And you can see by reading the genealogy of Jesus, hallelujah, where it comes, the bloodline flows from Adam, hallelujah, from Adam, Isaac, on down, Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, and it flows down to the birth of Christ. So Christ is the son of David, which is the seed of Abraham. Now, what a remarkable statement. Not all who are des descended from Israel are Israel. Paul is saying that in God's book, just to be born a Jew is not enough. In order to experience the full spiritual blessings of the covenant, one must be a Jew with faith. What Paul is, uh, uh, what Paul is a, the need for every person, whether Jew or Gentile, 
for the gospel of God's grace. Hallelujah. Now in the next in our next lesson we are going to talk about how Paul will express this fundamental revelation even further in our next lesson. What is true circumcision? As Paul had traveled preaching the gospel, he had received his greatest persecution from his own people, the Jews. And when you are walking in the truth of God's word, you will receive persecution, hallelujah, from those that call on the name of Christ, hallelujah, in the church, in and outside the church. Paul said he suffered persecution inside and outside, hallelujah. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22 to 27. Thus we must read the scriptures and understand that those have been, that have been born again are the seed of Abraham, the spiritual children of Abraham. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22 to 27, it reads, They are Hebrews, so am I. They are Israelites, so am I. They are descendants of Abraham, so am I. Are they, are they ministering servants of Christ the Messiah? I am talking like one besides himself, but I am more, with far more extensive and abundant labors, with far more imprisonments, beating, with countless stripes, and frequently at the point of death. Five times I received from the hands of the Jews forty lashes, all but one. Three times I have been beaten with rods, once I was stoned, Three times I have been aboard a ship, wrecked at sea. A whole night and a day I have spent adrift on the deep. Many times on journeys, exposed to perils from rivers, perils from bandits, perils from my own nation, perils from the Gentiles, perils in the city, perils in the desert places, perils in the sea, perils from those posing as believers, but destitute of Christian knowledge and piety. That's kind of deep, don't you think so? In toil and hardship, watching often through sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, frequently driven to fasting by want, in cold and exposure and lack of clothing. And besides those things that are without, there is the daily inescapable pressure of my care and anxiety for all the churches. Paul went through. He was persecuted severely. It said that he was stoned. Hallelujah. And God delivered him from that. Paul went through much. Hallelujah. Because he preached of the name of Yeshua Jesus Christ. Let's turn to Acts chapter 13 and we're going to read verses 45 to 50. Hallelujah. But when the Jews saw the crowds filled with envy and jealousy, they contradicted what was said by Paul and talked abusively, reviling and slandering him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out plainly and boldly, saying, It was necessary that God's message concerning salvation through Christ should be spoken to you first. But since you thirst it from you, you pass this judgment on yourselves, that you are unworthy of eternal life, and out of your own mouth you will be judged. Now behold, we turn to the Gentiles, the heathen. For so the Lord has charged us, saying, I have set you to be a light for the Gentiles, the heathen, that you may bring eternal salvation to the uttermost parts of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and glorified, praised and gave thanks for God, for the word of God. And as many as were destined, appointed and ordained to eternal life, believed, adhered to, trusted in and relied on Jesus as the Christ and their Savior. 
And so the word of the Lord concerning eternal salvation through Christ scattered and spread throughout the whole region. But the Jews stirred up the devout women of high rank and the outstanding men of the town and, and, assassin, and agitated persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their boundaries. They Notice they got jealous. They got upset. They got angry. They got mad. Hallelujah. Because they were preaching to the Gentiles. Salvation was offered to the Gentiles. And you can read later more, even more, about the trials of Paul in the book of Acts, chapter 14, verse 19 and 20. Let's go there. Acts 14, 19 and 20 reads, But some Jews arrived there from Antioch and Iacum, and having persuaded the people and won them over, they stoned Paul, and afterwards dragged him out of the town, thinking that he was dead. But the disciples formed a circle about him, and he got up and went back into the town, and on the morrow he went on with Barnabas to Derby. Wow! They thought he was dead. And it said that the disciples circled him. I believe that they were praying for him, praying to God to raise him back up, strengthening him. And then it said he went back into the town preaching the gospel. Paul was just persistent. Hallelujah. Paul, because of that encounter on the road of Demachus with Christ, it empowered Paul. Paul had no fear. When Paul gave his very life up, he died completely to self because of the encounter with Christ. We all should pray for that encounter with Christ. Read a little bit more about Paul in Acts 17, verses 5 through 14. Acts chapter 18, verse 12 and 13. Acts 21, verse 10 through 13. Acts 17 through... Thir um, Acts 21, 17 to 36. And Acts chapter 22, 7 to 26 about Paul's trials and persecution, how he was hunted down and persecuted because he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this was because he taught that the right of circumcision was no longer a requirement by God, and this offended the Jews. Not only did it offend them, Paul was preaching the gospel that you didn't no longer the requirement for the circumcision was no longer and the jews got offended by it as paul said to the galatian the galatian christians in galatians chapter 5 11, 5 verse 11 brothers if i am still preaching circumcision why am i still being persecuted in that case the offense of the cross has been abolished even some of the Jews who had become believers in Christ had tried to instill the need for circumcision into the young church, claiming that faith in Christ plus, plus circumcision and obeying God's law makes us righteous. Hallelujah. And e that is being preached today. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 6. And we're going to read verse 12 through 13. I'm going to read this over. Even some of the Jews who had become believers in Christ had tried to install the need for circumcision into the young church, claiming that faith in Christ plus circumcision and obeying God's law makes us righteous. Now in Genesis chapter 6, Verse 12 through 13, Paul had this to say about these people called Judaizers because they wanted to Judaize the Gentiles or make Jews out of the Gentile believers. And it reads, those who want to make a good impression and a fine show in the flesh 
would try to compel you to receive circumcision simply so that they may escape being persecuted for alliance to the cross of Christ the Messiah the anointed one for even the circumcised Jews themselves do not really keep the law but they want to have you circumcised in order that they may glory in your flesh your subjection to external riots rights it was a law for a child a male child or any male that was born that after eight days they were to be circumcised that was a law that God commanded and this is the law that Paul is talking about the law of circumcision and the Jews got upset because Paul was saying that there was no longer a need for it because of the new covenant that was a, that is in Christ Jesus but Paul was strong in refuting this era in Galatians let's turn to Galatians chapter 15 I'm sorry Galatians chapter 5 verses 2 through 6 he writes notice it is I Paul who tells you that if you receive circumcision Christ would be of no effect advantage avail to you for if you distrust him you can gain nothing from him I once more protest and testify to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation and bound to practice the whole of the law and its ordinances if you seek to be justified and declared righteous and to be given a right standing with God through the law you are brought to nothing and so separated severed from Christ you have fallen away from grace from God's gracious favor and unmerited blessings for we not we for we not relying on the law but through the Holy Spirit's help by faith anticipate and wait for the blessing and good for which our righteousness and right standing with God our conformity to his will in purpose thought and action causes us to hope for, for if we are in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything but only faith activated and energized and expressed and working through love glory to God he says that circumcision or uncircumcision counts for anything and today in our world the only reason why a male would get a cir circumcised is for medical reasons that they say that it's more is is um I can't remember the uh, medical terminology for it but we we circumcise our sons for medical reasons hallelujah because the foreskin it accumulates germs that's what it's for is for uh, um, it, because the foreskin accumulates germs if it's not washed properly so to avoid all of that uh, we we get our son circumcised I had my son circumcised not because of the law because I didn't know anything about the law of circumcision at that time but for medical reasons hallelujah um, let me see if my time is running out if we had, can go through some more scriptures hallelujah uh, let's jump to uh, Galatians chapter 2 verse 21 we're going to go through these real quick Galatians 20 um, chapter 2 verse 21 reads therefore I do not treat God's gracious gift as something of minor importance and defeat its very purpose I do not set aside and invalidate and frustrate and nullify the grace and merit faith of favor of God for its justification righteousness acquittal from guilt comes through observing the ritual of the law then Christ the Messiah died groundlessly and to no purpose and in vain his death was then holy superfluous hallelujah it's not by us observing ritual or keeping the law that we are saved it's by our faith in Christ the Messiah 
hallelujah, and being born again of the water, water and the spirit. Our faith in Christ being united with him. He is our Passover lamb. He is our sacrifice. He, he is the one that paid our price for redemption. You can read later on Galatians chapter 3 verse 1 through 14. I'm going to continue on. It seems like chapter 8 is a very long chapter. And uh, my time is, de is, is definitely running out. Hallelujah. On uh, Mixler. I only have an hour on Mixler. And I want to use, um, take advantage of that hour. But until then, read Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. And Galatians chapter 6, verses 12 through 15 and we'll pick up from there on tomorrow um for i have a, a little time to go through that um i have a little time to go through uh some more scriptures let's jump to galatians chapter 3 uh and we're going to read chapter 3 1 through 14 Hopefully I have enough time to go through this whole entire scripture. And it says, O oh, you poor and silly and thoughtless and unreflecting and senseless Galatians, who has fascinated or bewitched or cast a spell over you, unto whom right before your very eyes Jesus Christ the Messiah was openly and graphically set forth and portrayed as crucified? Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit as the result of obeying the law and doing its works? Or was it by hearing the message of the gospel and believing it? Was it from observing a law of rituals or from a message of faith? Are you so foolish and so senseless so, and so silly, having begun your new, spirit, your new life spiritually with the Holy Spirit, are you now reaching perfection by dependence on the flesh? Have you suffered so many things and experienced so much all for nothing to no purpose? If it really is to no purpose and in vain, then does he who supplies you with his marvelous Holy Spirit and works powerfully and miraculously among you do so on the grounds of your doing what the law demands or because of your believing in and adhering to and trusting in and relying on the message that you heard. Thus Abraham believed in and adhered to and trusted in and relied on God, and it was reckoned and placed to his account and credited as righteousness, as conformity to the divine will and purpose, thought and action. No one understand that it is really the people who lived by faith who are the true sons of Abraham. The scriptures foreseeing that God would justify, declare righteous, put in right standing with himself, the Gentiles in consequence of faith, proclaimed the gospel foretelling the glad tidings of a Savior long beforehand to Abraham in the promise saying, And you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So then those who are people of faith are blessed and made happy and favored by God as partners in fellowship with the believing and trusting Abraham. And all who depend on the law, who are seeking to be justified by obedience to the law of rituals, are under a curse and doomed to disappointment and destruction, for it is written in the scriptures, Cursed, accused, devoted to destruction, doomed to eternal punishment, be everyone who does not continue to abide, live, and remain by all the precepts and commands written in the book of the law, and to practice them. Now it is evident that no person is justified, declared righteous, and brought into right standing with God through the law. For the scripture says, the man in right standing with God, the just, the righteous, shall live by faith and out of faith. And he who through and by faith is declared righteous and in right standing with God shall live. But the law does not rest on faith, does not require faith, 
has nothing to do with faith. For it itself says, He who does them, the things prescribed by the law, shall live by them, not by faith. Christ persuade, per purchased our freedom, redeeming us from the curse, doom of the law, and its condemnation by himself, becoming a curse for us. For it is written in the scriptures, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, is crucified, to the end that through their receiving Christ Jesus, the blessing promised to Abraham might come upon the Gentiles, so that we, through faith, might all receive the realization of the promise of the Holy Spirit. It is not by us keeping the law that we are justified. We are justified in our faith in Christ the Messiah and what he has done on the cross for us. He purchased us with his own blood is what Paul is saying. And there are some out here that's telling that you must do the rituals. You have to go through all the rituals, hallelujah, in order to be saved. And that is not true, beloved. According to Galatians chapter 3, verse 1 through 14, not adding to it, not taking away from it. Many times people lean to their own understanding of the scriptures. And it is plain that we do not have to keep the rituals of the law. We do not have to observe the rituals of the law. Hallelujah. To be saved is our faith. In Yeshua HaMashiach that saves us, that makes us righteous and in right standing with the Father. Let's go to G uh, Galatians chapter 6 verse 12 through 15 which reads, Those who want to make a good impression and find a show in the flesh would try to compel you to receive circumcision simply so that they may escape being persecuted Hallelujah, for alliances to the cross of Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. For even the circumcised Jews themselves do not really keep the law, but they want to have you circumcised in order that they may glory in your flesh, your subjection to external rites. But far be it from me to glory in anything or anyone except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, through whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world for neither is circumcision now or any importance nor uncircumcision but only a new creation the result of a new birth and a new nature in Christ Jesus the Messiah being born again of water and the spirit being born again hallelujah the Galatian Christians particularly had believed this teaching of the Judaizers, and Paul wrote to them pulling no punches. J.B. Phillips translate Galatians chapter 3 verse 1 through 3 with these stinging words. He goes on to say, O oh, you dear idiots of Galata, who saw, who saw Jesus Christ, the crucified, Hallelujah. Who saw Jesus Christ crucified plainly? Who has been casting a spell over you? I will ask you one simple qu question. Hallelujah. I will ask you one simple question. Did you receive the Spirit by trying to keep the law or by believing the message of the gospel? Surely you can't be so idiotic as to think that a man be begins his spiritual life in the spirit and then completes it by reverting to outward observances. Paul was fearless in this declaration to the Jews at Rome also. His teaching was not that circumcision had been wrong, but that it had been a picture of what was to come. It had been fulfilled in Christ in the same way as all the Old Testament sacraments had been. God was now looking for the true circumcision of the heart. Okay, beloved, we're going to continue on tomorrow. 
uh, in lesson eight. Because we still got a few more scriptures to go through. In the meantime, read Galatians, uh, Genesis chapter 15, 1 through 6. Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 14, and 23 to 27. Exodus chapter 12, verse 48. Leviticus chapter 12, verse 3. And John chapter 7, verse 22. And we're going to continue on in our study of Romans. We're in lesson 8 of Romans chapter 2. The Old Testament right. We're going to talk about that on tomorrow, beloved, when we continue the book of Romans. Well, beloved, my time is definitely run out on, on Mixler and... Uh, let us close out in prayer. Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for truth, O oh Lord God, that we no longer, Father, are bound by the law to observe its rituals, O oh Lord God, but that our faith in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, is what counts. Being born again of water and the Spirit, Father God, is what you require. And we thank you for the blood that Christ shed on Calvary to redeem us, O oh Lord, from the curse of the law, that, that he purchased us, Father, that we may be able to come boldly before your throne of grace in time of need, Father, that we are called the children of Abraham, the spiritual seed. Thank you, Father, for this word on today. Father, watch over your word to keep it in the people's life, O oh Father. For you are all the while at work effectually working in them to do of your goodwill and pleasure. And that you are the finisher of their faith in Christ. We thank you, Lord. In Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, beloved, until tomorrow, may God bless you. May God keep you. May God's face shine up on you as you continue to sit at his feet as you continue to seek his face and sit at his feet and learn of him until then beloved god bless you and shalom